Hello, Marianne. Hey, can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. I think there was a setting I needed to disable at my end. Well, and this is the first time I've used this, so... Oh, it's the first time you used Discord? Yes. Ah, uh, now you're, you're part of the cool crowd. We'll see. <laughs> well, welcome to the stream. Uh, we currently have around 30 people watching right now. So, and yes. are, are you able to see the uh, the Twitch uh, screen as well? Yes, I have been enjoying it for uh, <laughs> about 20 minutes now. And the, the dizzying array of life that's going on in there, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, listen, Marianne, I want to tell everybody about you first. Um, we met okay. we met on Twitter a few months ago because I've only been on Twitter um, for since November and um, you are a scientist you it's interesting because you are you have a multidisciplinary approach I guess to science um, where you study aquatic ecology um, I saw on your website that you study the geomorphology of Mars or something around that I'm not 100% sure but um, do you want to give us a little brief, a little brief, uh, I don't know, explanation of what, of what you do? Absolutely, I'd love to. Um, yes, my uh, my my site is a little vague, and what I do professionally is I do study. I'm an aquatic ecologist, and I do study rivers and streams, um, specifically the benthic macroinvertebrates that live in rivers, streams, and lakes for water quality. And I do that for um, the state agency that I live in. So we go out and we sample um, streams and generally the samples of the benthic macroinvertebrates that we take go off to a taxonomic lab to be identified um, down to species, which can be pretty difficult sometimes. Um, but also I'm very interested in um, extremophiles and that's sort of how you and I uh, Twitter met because it was the uh, tardy grades. And so I've given talks about tardy grades. I was very interested in one point in um, getting a, uh, yes, creepy, little creepy colleague guys tend to look the same. <laughs> um, and uh, I was interested at one point getting a PhD. PhD in planetary science because I have a strong interest in astrobiology and um, what are the possibilities for life in our solar system. I kind of keep my personal interest within my solar system. So if anybody follows me on Twitter, they know my handle is at astro underscore limno. So limno is short for limnology, which is the study of inland uh, waterways, uh, lakes and things like that. So, um, but I was interested at one point thinking about getting a PhD in planetary uh, um, sciences. I figured I knew the geomorphology um, on Earth in terms of how streams uh, are, how they're developed, um, how they flow. And I thought, well, I could do that on Mars as well. And it's very funny because um, things that you think are really new are sometimes are not and um discovered that a lot all of mars has been mapped and uh but i do have interest in uh watery worlds and in icy moons and, and things like that so uh i take classes for that is it ever going to be a career probably not because i get a lot of compliments and i get a, a lot of joy so much personal joy from being in water, being in streams, looking at bugs, going out just like this, getting pond samples during the winter time when I don't get a lot of bugs, especially terrestrial bugs like dragonflies and um, other bugs. I do get a lot of pond samples like this and have fun to, to watch them and find new things and um, that awesome vorticella on the uh, cyclops you had earlier was just like swoon. I love them. <laughs> well, I, I just want to uh, clarify something for people who might not know some of the terms that you just used, which is benthic uh, macroinvertebrates uh, include what kind of, of bugs? Great. Thank you for uh, helping me with that, because uh, I always forget that not everybody speaks my, uh, my, my geeky language. <laughs> so 
Benthic means bottom, so bottom of a stream, bottom of a lake. And macroinvertebrates are invertebrates large enough to see with the naked eye. And so we know that a tardigrade is an invertebrate or a vorticella is an invertebrate, but we only get to see them underneath the microscope. Um, the creatures that I look at are definitely a lot of the larval forms of um, aquatic insects like mayflies, stoneflies, and, and caddisflies, just like caddisflies, I love them. And, um, and then also other invertebrates like snails and clams. So with the, the aquatic insects, they generally have um, mayflies and stoneflies have incomplete metamorphosis. They spend most of their life in the water. Um, and then like mayfly, but for a day, ephemeroptera, but for a day, is um, they live for no more than 72 hours outside of the water, but they can live up to two years in their larval form in the water. So dragonflies, damselflies, and again, other creatures that are not necessary, necessarily insects, snails, uh, little clams, worms, uh, water mites are super cool. And so um, a lot of those planaria, um, you have your plant, your, your planaria and your, your pond, uh, do. your pond jar there. And so all of these tell a great story. One of my mottos is the smallest of creatures can tell you about the biggest of problems. That's and, a- um, that's what I did. My, um, my, uh, uh graduate work was looking at the community structure of benthic uh, macroinvertebrates. Okay, Mar- Mr. Marvelous. Cultus has a question. Should I answer that now, or uh, we're going to get to the questions af- like later? Um, okay, I want I want to I want to actually. So the way I want to direct this is that I want to I want to talk about um, what we're looking at right now. And you you mentioned uh, mayflies, right? Uh, mayfly mm-hmm. larvae. I actually have one in in the second sample that I have. So maybe we could look at that real quick too. Because oh, awesome. yeah, they're they're we so we call them um, peat. That's a running joke on Instagram when one one of my fans actually called um, the the mayfly larva peat, and so now we just every time we see one we go peat. So okay. don't be surprised if you <laughs> if you have that comment come up. Um, but so you you do also specialize or you know a lot about diatoms, correct? I do know. Um enough about diatoms i love them um part of my job as well besides getting the um invertebrate samples uh diatoms can tell you a lot about water quality as well and so um it is something that i do spend a lot of time i love seeing them in samples uh the one you have right now is dead right there oh how do you Mm -hmm. know how do you know it's dead because the, the inside, when they're alive, is a beautiful golden color. Um, oh. So diatoms are algae. And uh, I do have a bumper sticker that says, um, for every fifth breath that you take, thank diatom. Um, so that one, you can see that one's got some goldenness right there in the center. Yep. Um, so he could be alive. Some diatoms can actually move, which is pretty cool. Um, and that is not really completely determined how they're able to move. I thought and it was a flagella. Think, pardon me? I thought they had a flagella, the ones that move. No. Oh. Yeah, okay. they don't. They, um, they can. There's. Some of them, they glide, and some say, some people say, oh, they're just moving. Oh, oh, go back There's up. one. Okay, the one on the right, that one's alive. Look at him go. So that's a little diatom, and I'm looking at my guide, and um, to see what kind he might be. I'm just, I've uh, just zoomed but, in. Yeah. Um, It is, I am thinking, do, 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 I'm thinking it may be a navicula, N-A-V-I-C-U-L-A. I apologize. Um, yep, somebody just said navicula. I apologize. <laughs> Thank if I, you. Uh, um, if I stumble over words sometimes when I get super excited, I, I have a little bit of a speech impediment and it that's comes okay. out. That's okay. That's all right. I'm super excited we found one that's moving. 
Yeah, it's great. And so some there's some theory that they can use their um, – what they have are two shells or called rafts, rafts, R-A-F-F-E maybe, and that they can open and close, but, but they are algae. And they do photosynthesize. And the great thing about them is they have, for other animals that eat them, like fish and benthic invertebrates that do eat them, um, they they have a lot of fatty acid in them. Oh. Um, like we think we think about omega-3 fatty acids that's really good and healthy for us. Same thing with diatoms. I had no idea. Because also I didn't know that... Um, I. I had read somewhere on, on the internet that diatoms are neither plant nor animal. Is that, is that an accurate statement? Um, we do. They are characterized as um, algae, so plant, because they do photosynthesize. And generally how they reproduce is through cell division. So essentially, you, you're looking at something that is photosynthesizing. Um, okay. It, and sometimes I wonder if you, the one that we're sort of following now, I wonder if they use, it looks like it has a gas vacuole in there. Um, and if that helps them move. And so some people say they move just because the water's moving. But when you look at this guy, it seems he's not going with the flow. Is it intentional? Well, we don't know. But he, he's moving in a particular direction, not necessarily going with the flow. Yeah, some of the diatoms that I think about with work is um, in a stream, if you get a lot of sediment in a stream, some diatoms are able to come up above a lot of that sedimentation. So that would be an indicator that you got a lot. If you had a lot of this particular diatom in your sample, you could infer, wow, did I have a sedimentation situation where a lot of sediment came into the stream? Um, some diatoms are very um, uh, acidophilic. They like living in um, low pH um, streams. Here in Nevada, we have a lot of old mines, and you have acid mine drainage from the streams, and diatoms will prefer that. They'll like that more than some diatoms will prefer that of, over uh, more neutral pH water. Okay, so the ones that I'm seeing here to the right, hold on here, I'm just going, these ones here, the ones, uh, would you say that these guys are dead too, just because they're see-through, or are these maybe a different kind? No, they're, they're dead as well. They are dead as well. Um, okay. And what, what which kills is, them? Which, you know, uh, life gets us all sometimes, right? Oh. Um, so, oh, that's a freak dude there. Um, but yes, if, if they're... So that looks like a diatom that's stuck on that piece of, uh, there we go. And I think that is going to be a, um, maybe another navicula or, hmm. Um, is that one not dead? not quite sure. I, it's hard to tell he looks dead. I think he's moving just because the water's moving and yeah. all of our little um, uh, uh, creatures are swimming around him. Okay. But That's some diatoms do attach and they stay in one place and they'll have stalks and they'll attach and some diatoms do move. What? That is mind blowing. I had no idea that some of them could attach. Yeah. Oh, that is so wild. Okay. okay. Wow. Ariel, he's he's he definitely has this calamnesius, probably. So okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, my other question is: uh, Do you want to tell us a little bit about the role of diatoms in our ecosystem? Well, it, like I said, because they do photosynthesize, they diatoms both. Um, Marine and fresh water do provide 20% of the world's oxygen. Um, in freshwater ecosystems, again, they're a great indicator of water quality. Um, they are, uh, um, oh, see, that's a nice one there. And he looks alive. Um, the, um, they do, they're a good indicator of water quality. 
Some of them can be invasive. Um, there's one particular uh, diatom that's on a stalk called um, um, Didymo. That's a nickname for it, and it's I'm not going to trip over the name, uh, but we call it rock snot, and it can, can, can completely cover a stream um, with this, this fuzzy carpet, and it really makes the stream in... Um, inhospitable for the other benthic macroinvertebrates. Now, one of the things with diatoms in marine systems, and I, hello, big guy, <laughs> in marine systems, um, which I'm not a marine uh, biologist or ecologist, but you have the, um, the harmful algal blooms that happen in marine systems where the diatoms that can occur in marine system, if you have a huge bloom of them, um, they will release a toxin, and it happens in fresh waters, but with the fresh waters, it happens with cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. Yes. Um, but in, in rain systems, you hear the red tide and what have you. That happens because of diatoms. That is wild. Um, I guess my, my last question uh, in, in regards to, actually, no, I have two more. Uh, the, one is, uh, what's the best way to find diatoms? If somebody like if somebody's at home with a microscope in a freshwater, you know, in Canada, let's say, what's the best way for them to find uh, diatoms? Well, usually when I go out um, for fun, because uh, during the summertime, all, I'm all about the emerged bugs or the bugs that are waking up. Um, but during the winter time, when I want to uh, get close to life, I do a lot of pond water and. What I'll do is sometimes just grab, if I'm at a pond, I'll just grab some of the, um, the, the macrophytes from the bottom of the pond a little bit, but usually at a stream, I go out with a, a toothbrush and a plastic bag, and I will take my toothbrush and scrub it all over a small cobble, maybe about the size of half the size of your fist, put that in a plastic bag, a little bit of stream water in there, and just scrub it with the toothbrush just a little bit. And then when I stick it under the microscope, there's so many diatoms. And it will tell you an awful lot about, um, again, the different species composition. Sometimes I'll get a sample and it's all one type of diatom. So that's a real sort of um, uh, no diversity if you only have a majority of the sample one di type of diatom. So a toothbrush and a small cobble. And the thing um, to remember is because they are on algae, if you do take a rock, you want to scrub the top of the rock off, the rock that's been facing um, towards the sun. And also you don't want to go too deep because light penetration, depending on how murky your water is, how clear your water is, when we sample at work, um, we don't ever take uh, a periphyte periphyton sample, that's what we call periphyton samples. So you have the soft-bodied algae, like the green algae um, in the cyanobacteria, and then the hard body algae, the diatom. But we don't take it greater than a half a meter in depth because of light penetration. So um, just at the side of a, 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 a pond or a stream, little rock, plastic bag, some water, and toothbrush, don't reuse the toothbrush in your mouth because your diatoms are probably okay but as we know uh pond water stream water has a lot of fun friends that don't make for good gastrointestinal health this actually leads to a great question that uh, somebody just asked about toothpaste um apparently there are diatoms in toothpaste um i can believe that uh i would see how that they would be an abrasive sometimes people will use diatomaceous earth so you can go down and um, to your garden center and buy a bag of diatomaceous earth, which is essentially um, a large kind of um, settlement of dead diatoms that they're getting from the earth. Sort of, uh, I don't, I've never seen a diatom mine, um, but uh, it, because they're glass, they will. Um, cut up slugs and stuff in your garden, the little creatures you don't want munching in your garden. Um, so I can believe that diatoms are probably used as an abrasive if you're looking for a whitening toothpaste. Brilliant. Uh, another quick, and, sorry, oh, go ahead. Uh, quick question. Have they found diatoms in space? No, 
No. Okay. No. Uh, somebody also, I'm going to move to the uh, user questions here. Um, somebody asked if they've found uh, water anywhere else in space, essentially, on the moon or on Mars or anything like that. Oh, that's a great question. So on the moon, it has been, when I, when I talk about things in space, um, I'm generally talking in generalizations. So on the moon, they have determined that there is water beneath the surface. Is it flowing water? No. Is it frozen water? Probably. Is it available to humans? I have no idea. Now on Mars, when you look at Mars, it's really carved with very deep canyons and rivers and deltas. And so one of the things for me when I was kind of disappointed because I've always believed that there would be diatoms on Mars. Um, when I started to research this back in 2017, what I didn't realize was that Mars lost its water um, over two and a half billion years ago. So um, I have read paper, I have read um, literature papers about this um, photosynthetic possibilities of diatoms and algae on Mars, and it's a could have happened. Um, Mars. Mars environment is very, very salty. There's a lot of perchlorates in on Mars that may prohibit um, any life if there was some there. Uh, but so there was water on Mars. Right now, there are um, subsurface ice sheets that are about, I think, two to three meters below the surface. Uh, and uh, there you have the ice caps, which ch generally tend to be CO2 water, carbon dioxide, rather than H2O. And then under the South Pole, there is a very, um, there is a, they discovered a lake. It's about a kilometer beneath the ice cap in the South Pole. And it's probably very salty. The lake is not frozen, so it's probably very salty. But a lot of researchers look at, um, uh, you know, sort of the stuff we're looking at here, but they get samples from really high saline lakes or dry lakes here in Nevada. Um, some places they've looked at bacteria and um, other, not only bacteria and other creatures there that survive in these really extreme areas or Antarctica. Um, and cyanobacteria really is, um, something that they look at as an organism <clears throat> for um, space exploration. So I know you asked about the moon and Mars, and I'm just going to hop out real quick to Saturn. So um, Saturn and Jupiter, Jupiter has Europa, and Saturn has a moon called Enceladus. And Enceladus has both, both Europa and Enceladus have these geysers, but Enceladus's geysers spray come out of the South Pole, the pressure ejects this water um, from this icy moon. So Europa has an ice shell with an ocean underneath it, and Encel so that's Jupiter, and Enceladus has an ice shell with a um, ocean under it. Now when Cassini was out at, Cassini was a probe that went out to Saturn and was there for a long time, and just did amazing science, but it flew through the probe and found traces of um, molecules that would, you would use to develop organic, um, uh, further organic molecules. And then one more moon is um, Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. And something that I'm super excited about is that there is a probe going there. It will land in 2034 called Dragonfly. But Titan has, it's the only moon that has an atmosphere um, and it has a lot of lakes and seas in the northern polar regions, and it rains, um, it has evaporation and precipitation, but it's not water, it's methane. Uh, so these giant seas and lakes that they have on Titan are actually liquid methane. And so um, unfortunately the dragonfly probe will not be going in that area but they're hoping to find more organic molecules that could point to um, some of the building blocks of what we would consider um, the foundational uh, molecules of life. 
I wish you could see my face right now, Marianne. <laughs> I'm just like smiling from ear to ear. I think I could listen to you talk all night. Um, by the way, I just want to go back to the the, the tip that you gave us for the, uh, the stones in the streams. It's something that I never would have thought of. And I know I, I'm seeing people in the chat saying, like Lane is saying, that, that I know what I'm doing after work tomorrow. <laughs> so because a lot of my viewers have actually uh, purchased microscopes and are now looking at microscopic life. So, Great. and now to talk about space, I wonder if you're gonna influence some people to start getting some telescopes too. So I think that'll be interesting. Um, I'm gonna, well, I think, I, sorry, go on. I, I'll, I'll say really quickly that my, my husband, this is when we were dating. He bought me my microscope when we were dating. So that was over Aww. about 20 years ago. And, um, I still use it all the time, and it's so hard for me to drive past a wetland and and not jump out. I, I keep water socks in my cars and little sample bags, and so it's really hard for me not to do that. And I ordered myself a super a nice enough telescope for me, but I can see the rings of Saturn with it when it arrives, and so I'm excited about that. So I think anytime you can explore life here on Earth, or the possibility to be out there in our solar system. Um, what what a great thing to do. What a great thing to think about. I 100% agree. I actually look at moss in video games and wonder if they've hidden tardigrades in it. So that's how obsessed I have gotten. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have time for one more question. I'm going to get the one from uh, Biomed Mo. Um, Biomed Mo says, diatoms are unicellular. Wondering what kind of subcellular organelles they would have. Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, thanks, uh, Biomedmo. You know, I imagine like any other um, unicellular organism, so they're they're going to have the chloroplasts. They need to make, um, they need to do the photosynthesis, so they're going to have the chloroplasts to do their own chlorophyll thing. Um, and then as far as that, I don't know of any of their other um, organelles that they would have. Um trying to think here oh yeah I can't think of any other organelles that they would have I did want to say one other thing about diatoms in terms of like a water quality thing is that they were really very instrumental in determining um, acid rain from the um, industrial age so when you had the acid rain in the industrial age when that rain fell on lakes it would kill and just kill the diatom species. So people who do paleo diatom research are able to see um, the diatoms that were before the industrial age and then the period when you had the acid rain that was really negatively affecting all the life in the lakes uh, down downwind, downstream of the, um, the, 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 the factories and stuff. And then once they were able to control what was being emitted from the factories and things like that, you could see the resurgent with resurgence of diatoms within these sediment core samples. So what's actually cool, I'm glad that you mentioned that because uh, one of the scientists that I have booked to call in to the live stream is a paleolinologist. So, ooh, ooh. sorry? I said, ooh, I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, totally, me too. I, I've actually met another one today, so, um, and who's interested in, in speaking, so we might even have two of them. Um, you know, two different areas of research, uh, still diatoms, but, uh, you know, two different areas of the world. So it's pretty fascinating, and uh, it's a it cool is. field of study. Mm -hmm. um, but listen, it's 8.30. Uh, we're not going to get to the mayfly larva, unfortunately, um, but I'm probably just going to look at it with the crowd anyways <laughs> afterwards. Well, I'll, I'll stay on and, and, and I'll, I'll, we'll hang up here, but I'll stay on and watch you look at him. Sure, if you'd like that. Um, listen, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and, and um, speaking with us and answering our questions. And um, you know what? It was just nice to hear your voice. It is nice to hear your voice, and um, I am so excited to talk to you, and I'm going to uh, sign up for Twitch right now because I'm ashamed this is the first time I've been here. Um, I see you posted all the time, 
and I'm so excited, and I love all these questions. Um, they're so great. Does, um, does so, that mean you're going to start live streaming too? Um, I, I, I'm not going to infringe on anybody's. Uh, this is this is your gig. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'll start maybe I'll start uh when I when I get my telescope I'll start uh live streaming um uh my my nighttime explorations oh please do I'm trying to get any scientist every scientist to be live streaming it's such a rewarding experience you're gonna love it but yes. uh but yeah thank you so much listen Marianne um I'm gonna be in touch with you to book a time for the podcast as well and um, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. It was great to talk to you.